right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Deschutes Land Trust February Nature Night. I'm so excited for this evening's topic and I'm glad you could join us. I'm Jana Hemphill, the Outreach Manager for the Deschutes Land Trust. We would like to begin this evening by respectfully acknowledging that we are visitors to the historical territories of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute bands of Native Americans. These bands are represented today by the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon. The Deschutes Land Trust considers the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs an important partner in management and restoration of our protected lands. These tribal communities are the original stewards of the land, helping care for and connect with the land since time immemorial. You can learn more about the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs by visiting the museum at Warm Springs. It is currently open with limited visitor numbers. Their website has been added to the chat. The Deschutes Land Trust works to conserve and protect lands throughout Central Oregon. Since 1995, we have protected more than 17,000 acres of land, continue to care for these lands, and ensure they will be strong and healthy both now and into the future. If you haven't yet, we encourage you to visit our community preserves, places like Waichus Canyon Preserve and the Metolius Preserve. If you'd like to learn more about our work, visit our website, DeschutesLandTrust.org. We'd like to invite you to join us at our next virtual nature night on Wednesday, March 17th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Pacific. Acclaimed author and scientist, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer will be presenting on restoration and reciprocity. If you haven't read her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, I highly recommend it. You can register for the March Nature Night on our website. The Deschutes Land Trust work is made possible thanks to the generosity of our community of supporters. Our supporters help protect new places, restore creeks, forests, and native plant communities, help wildlife adapt to climate change, and connect the community to the natural world. If you'd like to help protect Central Oregon's land, water, plants, and wildlife, and find yourself in a position to do so, please support this work with a gift to the Land Trust. You can make a donation through the website link that was just posted to the chat. Thank you in advance, and thank you to all of our current supporters for everything you have made possible. You truly are making a difference. A couple of notes for tonight's presentation. You have been muted and the chat feature has been disabled. However, tonight's speaker will be taking questions at the end of the evening. To ask your question at any point during the presentation, go to the bottom of your Zoom screen where you will find a Q&A box. Click on it, type your question there and send, and we will automatically receive it. If you're watching via Facebook Live, you can ask your questions in the chat. In the next few days, we will be sending you an email with a link and resources to tonight's presentation. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox. And now for this evening's presentation. Dr. Tara Cornelissi is an insect conservation biologist and senior scientist with the Endangered Species Program at the Center for Biological Diversity, a conservation nonprofit. At the center, she is the resident entomologist and started the Saving the Insects campaign. Specifically, she works to get insects protected under the Endangered Species Act and on policy that advances insect conservation. She has conducted research on monarch butterfly habitat in urban areas, conservation of endangered tiger beetles, and on insect conservation education. She holds a PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Before joining the center, she was a postdoctoral scholar at the American Museum of Natural History and an assistant professor in animal behavior, ecology, and conservation at Canisius College. Her favorite insects are the Ohlone tiger beetle, dung beetles, and the yellow-faced bumblebee. Please wait a moment as we switch our screens and presentations around, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Tara Cornelissi to Nature Nights. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, Jenna. Um, thank you very much. Um, as, as she mentioned, I am Dr. Tara Cornelissi. I'm a senior scientist with um, the Endangered Species Program at the Center for Biological Diversity. There's our logo up there in the left-hand corner. 
I'm really delighted to be here tonight with you all to discuss my favorite topic of insects. Um, I'm hoping to include some sort of basic information for those of you who are less familiar with what an insect is, um, talk a little bit about their importance, of course, the title of the talk here, um, as well as kind of what's going on with insects right now. Some of you may have heard that there's um, a conservation crisis. You know, there's a lot of insect decline. So talk about what evidence we have for that. And then, of course, um, using Oregon examples, how we can how we can help insects, how we can conserve them, some of the work that I do, as well as some of the things that you can do as well. Um, so first I'll tell you a little bit about my background um, and then later I'll get more into the work that I do with the Saving the Insects campaign at the center. All right. Okay, so um, to go way back, uh, I grew up uh, in Michigan. Um, I could say I am in California now, so I'm not super, I'm super happy to not be in Michigan at the moment with the, the snow. <laughs> I'm sorry to some of you up there in Oregon. Um, I actually just moved down from Portland, so I used to live up in Oregon. Uh, but I grew up in Michigan and I spent um, summer vacations along the shore of Lake Michigan. So that's a picture here of that. Um, and what I used to do is kind of walk up and down the dunes and look around for beetles. So I would see things like this. Um, so we've got a couple longhorn beetles, ladybug, of course, everyone knows, and the tiger beetle. Um, and so I sort of, that's kind of where my love for insects began. And then I took it to a more scholarly level and I went to college at Boston University where I got my degree in biology um, and ecology and conservation. And I got to study abroad uh, in Ecuador, which is where my love for dung beetles started to emerge. Um, I also did some research on termites while I was there. And then um, after I graduated, um, I took a year before I went back to grad school and worked in the deserts of California on um, an endangered species, not an insect, but the desert tortoise. But that is where sort of my um, interest in the Endangered Species Act started to emerge. And so I decided to go to grad school to then be able to not only study insects, but also insect conservation, trying to merge the two. So I went to get my master's degree in conservation biology at San Francisco State University, where I worked on um, tiger beetles at Point Reyes National Seashore. So kind of back to the dunes. Um, but then I also sort of became a tiger beetle person. And then I decided to get my PhD down at UC Santa Cruz where I worked on, um, as Jana said, the endangered Ohlone tiger beetle. So here is a picture of that beauty. Um, so I love tiger beetles, as she mentioned. And tiger beetles are, are really neat because they are a family of predaceous beetles. Um, and you can kind of see from the top right hand corner picture, um, it, they have big jaws and so they're predators and they run along open areas to try to find their prey. Uh, they also find mates that way um, using their large eyes. Um, and then they also lay eggs in the bare ground as well. And then the larvae that hatch from those eggs are also predators. And so they make burrows in the spot where the female lays the egg and um, attack anything walking by their burrow, basically. Um, so these guys need open bare ground, as you can imagine. And so that's one of the reasons that the Ohlone tiger beetle is an endangered species. So it occurs in Santa Cruz County. So I was lucky that, um, you know, I went to UC Santa Cruz and I could just study a local species. It's only in that county. It's only found in a few remnant um, coastal terrace prairies. So you can kind of see one of them up there in the picture with me um, looking under the net there. Um, my colleague. And um, it's only found in a few of them, unfortunately. And that is because they have become overrun with invasive grasses, at least those that are left. A lot of them have been developed. They occur in really beautiful areas near the ocean, so prime real estate. Um, but the ones that are left are kind of overrun with non-native European grasses, which a lot of um, ecosystems, you know, in Oregon are also um, under threat because of. And so unfortunately, they need ongoing management, whether that is grazing or even recreational trails or even, you know, us going in there and literally scraping the ground to create bare ground for these guys, because that's what we do. So I continue to work on this species. I, I did my dissertation on it, but I continue to work. That picture is me last year. Um, right before COVID um, sort of became a thing. It was about the first weekend in March, I think. We actually did a translocation project where we caught some of them, and that's what I'm doing there, and moved them over to a habitat um, that they used to be found on, but they were 
had gone from and now they're back because we moved them there. Uh, we also had to do a lot of uh, restoration work at that habitat before we could get, make it good for the beetles. Um, and I'm happy to report that I saw one there um, just recently last week. Um, so it worked and we're hoping to continue to augment that population as well. So um, remember all that information about tiger beetles because we're gonna have another example from an Oregon tiger beetle pretty soon. All right, so um, something Jana also mentioned is that I also am really interested in education and education around insect conservation. So after I finished my PhD, I went to the American Museum of Natural History. And most people think that, you know, you probably went there to do taxonomy and to work in the collections. But in fact, I actually went there to do uh, education, conservation education. And um, I really got into it there. And um, I became an assistant professor shortly thereafter, after doing some adjuncting. And while I was in those both of those places, I actually studied the connection between people's knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors towards insects. So try to see like, um, and it actually was more with with kids, with students, so kind of fourth and fifth grade ages, if the knowledge of insects that they had actually influenced if they would be interested in conserving them. And in fact, found that, yeah, if they did actually learn a little bit more about insects, but also particularly that insects can be in danger, that they can, you know, become extinct, that really increased the interest um, in conservation. So knowledge is important. So I'm very happy, you know, to be here talking to you today because that's what this is all about. And I hope that, you know, you go on and continue to spread the word about how awesome insects are and how they also need us to help conserve them. Okay, so kind of just some basics here for some of you who might not know um, this and, and you know, that's very common. Um, basically, an insect is a specific thing, you know, it's not um, a spider is different, you know, I'll get to that pretty soon, a scorpion is different, but an insect, um, and if I don't know if any of you guys got to see the wonderful blog the Deschutes Land Trust posted before this talk in conjunction with this talk, but I encourage you to go check it out because it gives some really nice background information. But just to kind of recap quickly, um, all insects have three body parts. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And out of that thorax in the middle comes all the appendages. So there's three, um, well, there's six legs, so three pair of legs. And then pretty much all, almost all of them have two pair of wings. Um, there is an exception and I'll tell you that in a minute. They also have antennae. And a lot of times they also have sort of complex eyes like the tiger beetle you could see. And sometimes they have simple eyes on top of their heads as well. All right, so some of the modifications of wings that kind of throw people off are, are beetles. Um, so, you know, beetles have this harder outer shell, right? That's what um, a lot of people say. It's called an elytra. And basically it's those um, four wings or those front wings that are hardened for protection. Um, protection from predators um, as well as from desiccation, so drying out. Um, and then flies are a really neat, a neat kind of insect because uh, they only have two pair of wings. Um, so the order flies is diptera, so there's two wings, but they still have, so they used to have, they come from an insect that had four, but they've adapted and evolved to only have two, but they still have these kind of appendages called haltiers, you can kind of see there. And um, those are what make flies flies. Basically they can, um, they use them for balance. They make them so they're such good flyers. Um, you know, one of the things about beetles is that they're really clumsy flyers because they have those, you know, elytra, those heavy outer four wings. And so, you know, you can really start to tell the difference between some insects by the way they fly. And if they kind of do cool maneuvers like this, you know, it's, it's most likely a fly because other things can't really do that. Um, so, you know, the other great thing about insects is there's a wide diversity of form and function. And we'll kind of look at that in a minute. Um, all right, another kind of basic thing that I think a lot of people are unaware of is that, um, you know, there's kinds of two basic life cycles of insects. And the one that we sort of all learn as children is this idea of like complete metamorphosis, right? You've got an egg, you've got a caterpillar, you've got a chrysalis or a pupa or a cocoon, and you've got the adult. But that's actually just one kind of life cycle. It's the one, of course, obviously butterflies and moths, um, beetles, bees, 
um, flies, most of the sort of more um, evolved insects have those. The sort of more basal insects have this other thing called incomplete metamorphosis, where it's actually kind of similar, you know, to humans is that, you know, there is an egg and when it hatches, it's sort of like a mini adult. And then it grows successively molting as it grows to become the adult. And usually between the last nymph stage, each of the stages is called a nymph, and the adult, that is when it becomes sexually mature. So um, really neat, totally two different kinds of life cycles. And, and it's really important to know these and understand these for conservation, because you can imagine, you know, perhaps a um, a small nymph might have a very similar habitat need to a large adult in the incomplete metamorphosis, but with the complete, the caterpillar or larval stage often has a completely different habitat need, sometimes completely different food need than the adult does. So it's important to think about those for conservation. Okay, kind of one more sort of basic, uh, or a couple more basic things. Um, there, I just wanted to mention some other invertebrates that aren't insects. And I also like to kind of talk about this because of just like the sheer diversity of invertebrates. Um, you know, uh, we are all, everything with backbones is sort of in one phylum, right? But we've got these invertebrates that are in multiple phyla. So arthropods is the phylum that insects are in, as well as spiders and scorpions. However, there are other invertebrates like snails that are mollusks, um, roly polies or pill bugs or whatever you know them as, wood lice, you know, sometimes those are crustaceans. And then worms are in a completely different one of annelids. So we've got this like really diverse group um, that are, and these are all totally different than insects, <laughs> which are their own class. So it's pretty cool. I just like to think about that. Um, and kind of give you an overview. You know, I always try to find these kinds of pie charts that sort of show how many species are insects, you know, it's really difficult to actually find an accurate one. And, and the reason for that is, is because really we don't know, you know, there's, there's like maybe almost 2 million non-bacterial species described on the planet and about almost 1 million insects described. So, you know, it's like, you know, if you count all that, then it's a, it's a little over half of all of them. Um, if you're just looking at animals, it's more than that. Um, somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of species are insects. And so you can see here on this pie chart um, on the outer ring, it's our arthropoda, which is like the arthropods. So the other one up there that includes all other arthropods, like the spiders, um, the scorpions, that kind of thing. And then everything else here um, in, the, in the insecta, which is the class of insects, are all types of insects. Diptera, which are flies, Lepidoptera, um, moths and butterflies, Coleoptera, my favorite, beetles, Hymenoptera is actually bees, wasps, and ants, and then all the other insects, of which there are many. <laughs> and also you can see sort of mammalia as a class up there. It's a very tiny little slice of the pie. So, you know, another reason insects are, or one reason insects are important is because there are just so many of them, you know, that, that, that means something, it's got to mean something. Um, one of the most recent publications I've read that estimated how many insect species we might have was about, they estimated about five and a half million insect species. And so about 90% of them may be unnamed. Um, and so that again also estimates about 75% of all species. So, you know, something around there, but a lot of it, right? Yeah. Okay. So another really cool thing about insects that I think a lot of people overlook is just like how all of this diversity really translates to behavior. As Jana said, I actually got to teach animal behavior, which was really fun. And I get to realize too, like how unique insects are um, in the world. And so this amazing diversity like really lends to these unique forms and functions and behaviors. So I was just gonna kind of show you some cool things that you probably already have seen before, but just to remind you since we're talking about them. You know, some really cool like predation sometimes in other insects, um, some swarming behavior, you know, um, ants always also exhibit um, social sociality or social behavior as well, like bees, like some bees do. Um, we've got, you know, like territoriality and, and fighting for territory, fighting for mates. Um, we've got some like anti-predator defense. This is this cute little guy. Um, something called mate guarding, you know, where um, males will actually like guard mates to ensure paternity. 
um, because female insects actually have organs called spermathicas where they can store sperm and, and use it or not, basically. Um, and communication is a really another cool form of insect behavior. Fireflies, obviously we don't have these flashy ones here on the West Coast, um, but uh, I, I might mention on, on the firefly we do have. And then, um, you know, crickets are such like the quintessential communication as well. So it's, it, you know, we've really learned a lot um, from insects about ecology. Here. So something to also keep in mind. Okay, so something you'll probably hear more about in terms of why insects are important is like basically what they do for us, right? It's like what ecosystem services they provide. Um, and ecosystem services are, are, are defined as services that are provided by nature um, for human survival and well-being. Um, and so things like nutrient cycling, dung beetles are super famous for this, right? They bring back the nutrients from dung to the earth. Um, termites are uh, also famous for this, but in a less favorable light. Um, but most termites, you know, don't eat houses. They actually build really cool mounds and recycle dead wood and all this really cool stuff they do. Um, pollination, you know, is the number one thing if you ask what insects do for us. Um, and I like to show a picture of a hoverfly pollinating because hoverflies are, are very important pollinators. And of course, bees get all the credit. Um, I mean, not that they don't deserve it, but hoverflies are important too. Um, seed dispersal, ants are really good at that. Uh, biological control is another one that a lot of people overlook. Um, you know, we can really decrease our dependence on pesticides by increasing our dependence on biological control. Here's a parasitic wasp, um, you know, laying eggs in this lepidopteran uh, larvae. Also, another thing that I think gets overlooked um, is just the indication of our environmental health. So aquatic species like this dragonfly larva, you know, can really, um, you know, how they're doing kind of indicates how our water's doing. If we've got a good diversity of these larvae or of these species, these aquatic species, then, you know, the water is probably pretty clear and healthy. Obviously, that's very important for us, right? Um, here's just kind of a quick sort of uh, um, overview of some of the ecosystem services that we depend on. This is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which really looked at how ecosystem services are impacting us and how much we need them. Um, and the, the stem here in this flower figure is the supporting ecosystem services, which a lot um, you know, comes from insects as well as regulating and provisioning. All right. Um, another thing that people like to talk about is sort of how much is this all worth uh, monetarily? Um, you know, it's, it's not something that I really like to, but I also recognize the extreme importance of it. Um, and I think it's a really important component. This is a paper from um, 2006. It's still pretty widely cited, actually, um, kind of looked at the um, value of insect ecosystem services. And um, I found this figure that has 67 billion per year. I think the paper kind of uh, looked at between, found sort of between like 50 and 70 billion per year. Um, and these are kinds of all those things I just talked about that they provide. There's been an, a really recent paper um, that I just checked out right before this. And in fact, it used data from 2012 um, because it was the only thing available to the authors. And they found that for pollination alone, insect pollination brought 34 billion per year in 2012. So, you know, their, the ecosystem services provided by insects are very valuable. Okay, so what's happening now? Um, bear with me, I'm gonna show you a few graphs, um, but they're pretty simple, I think, and I kind of walk you through them. But basically in about 2014, uh, this group of scientists published this paper in science called Defaunation in the Anthropocene, which basically means loss of animals in the human world today. Um, and this was 2014, and they looked at a global, they did a global assessment, so this isn't just North America, um, but they looked at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, I believe, and some other data sets as well, and they were able to assess 67% of invertebrate populations, and they found that over the past 40 years, 67% um, of them show a 45% decline in mean abundance, so that means the total number of individuals. So, a 45% decline, that's pretty concerning. They found for the major insect orders, the, the beetles here you can see, there's a 60% decreasing 
Um, Hymenoptera, which again are ants and bees and wasps, so about 50, which is still pretty true today. Uh, butterflies and moths, they found around 30. And for the um, Odonata, which are damselflies and dragonflies, more around 20. And then a really concerning one for um, crickets and grasshoppers. So this kind of started off a little bit of the, the research that we're seeing more today about declines in insects. Then there was a paper out of Germany from 2017 uh, that was a long-term study. Um, community scientists, even uh, you know, not not necessarily professionals, contributed to this, and they they weighed insects in the same locations for almost over 30 years, and they found that the biomass, the actual weight of the insects they caught, went down 75 percent. So that's huge, right? You know, they they sh if you you can look up some articles on this, and they'll show the jars and how they they were really full and now they're, they're not so full. Um, this article kind of set off more popular press. I don't know, some of you may have seen this uh, New York Times Magazine piece um, that kind of coined the term insect apocalypse, which became a little bit popular in the press for a few years. Uh, since then, there have been more articles. One comprehensive review looked at uh, papers that looked at declines in insects. And um, this is a little bit of a, you know, graph, graphy graph, but uh, basically, if you pay attention to the orange and yellowish color parts of the bars, that's the, the bad stuff, you know, that's the vulnerable and endangered. And the gray part is actually the really bad, that's the extinct. Um, the first sort of four categories from the left to the right are beetles. Um, you can see dung beetles in particular are not doing great, which makes me very sad. Um, and then if you look at the bees as well, that's a very concerning category. And then butterflies and moths. Some of you might be thinking like, well, um, those are pretty charismatic insects and you would be right. Those are the ones that we know the most about. Uh, and that's because people have studied them more, they're more visible. Um, and so this is all obviously based on what we have available to us. Um, for aquatic insects, this one's kind of small, but you can kind of see quickly that for aquatic insects, they also saw that there was quite a bit of decline um, over the past 30 years. Um, and they also, an, a really key finding out of this was that they found that some very um, generalist species were declining. So not just rare species, but actually some common species, which is kind of what the newer studies are starting to show, which is pretty concerning. And then this one um, was a great publication, a meta-analysis, which basically means a study of studies. So it got all the studies and put them together and said, what can, we, what can we say? So if you look at the top map of the world, that's showing terrestrial insects. And so those are insects that are, live on land. Um, and for the most part, a lot of the dots are kind of the reddish color, which is the bad color, right? <laughs> like they're declining. Um, and then the bottom half is the freshwater fauna. So things like dragonflies, again, caddisflies, um, mayflies. And for those, they found less of a decline. And so they titled their paper, Meta-Analysis Reveals Decline in Terrestrial, but Increases in Freshwater Insect Abundance. And there's been a lot of caveats to this and back and forth. And of course, you can see that there's lots of red dots and are mixed with the blue dots for the freshwater. And kind of the bottom line that came out of this paper was that terrestrial insects are declining about one to 2% per year, or about 10 to 20% per decade, which is alarming and that has since been you know corroborated while it's less clear for freshwater fauna and it depends on where you are so the kind of take-home message is sort of like it's hard to generalize but we've got a problem <laughs> okay so why is this happening? Yeah, so that's kind of the next logical question, right? Um, that review um, also looked into reasons. Um, the biggest one is habitat loss, you know, the number one issue. In the case of insects, that habitat loss is usually due to agricultural intensification, right? So commodity crops, getting monocultures, using a lot of inputs, a lot of fertilizers, a lot of pesticides. Um, climate change studies are starting to show more issues, particularly because insects are declining in protected areas. Why is that happening? Um, climate change seems to be the culprit for that. Um, and of course, all of this, you know, is exacerbated by the uh, different life cycles that we talked about and all the needs and habitat needs that insects have. Okay. Um, 
this is kind of like a, a hairy figure, but basically a new uh, collection of articles came out. If you guys are, are interested in looking at the scientific literature, or there was a lot of popular press written about these articles too. But in the um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a collection of articles came out that talked about basically what's going on, what are the climate change impacts, and then what can we do? And this was very recent, just last month. And the sort of prime uh, introductory article really hit the nail on the head um, by using this metaphor that I really like to use too, because it's such a great one, is, is that insects are experiencing a death by a thousand cuts. And that is to say basically that there are so many things <laughs> that are happening that are causing populations to decline here and there. Um, and this figure, I don't need to really go through it all, but basically it gives you a nice kind of overview of all of the things that insects are experiencing. Um, you know, colony collapse disorder, which you probably heard in the press about 10, 15 years ago with bees, uh, was kind of something around this, right? Like habitat loss, pesticides, diseases, climate change, they're all impacting bees and that's what's making a decline. There's really no like one silver bullet. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Okay. So let's look at some specific groups. Um, so as I mentioned, there are some that really have a lot of information and some that don't. And bumblebees are one of those that have a lot of information, mostly because we only have about 47 species in North America. So it's very clear and clean and easy to, to figure out. Um, so uh, bumblebee scientists are probably like shaking their heads at me if they were listening. Uh, so anyway, so we've got, um, these categories of uh, threatened. So this is from the International Union of Conservation of Nature again. Um, and so they categorize insect species or all species, not just insect species, as um, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, threatened, least concerned, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. You can kind of see those at the top. Basically, this recent paper from 20, last year showed that um, of the 47 species we have in North America, 26% of them are kind of in that threatened category. So that's pretty alarming. And, you know, time and time again, we keep seeing that bumblebees are declining by about 50% in certain states. Vermont, Michigan, other places have looked at this. Um, in some, in some cases, some species are declining by up to 96%. So it's, when it's bad, it's really bad, basically. Um, and bumblebees are really important because they provide uh, something called buzz pollination. So honeybees do not do this. Um, honeybees are also not native, whereas these bumblebees are. And they, they do this buzz pollination. Basically, they vibrate the whole body. And, they, um, and some plants will only be pollinated that way. So not only is it important for lots of crops, um, tomatoes, cranberries, blueberries, um, but also, you know, non-crop vegetation. So all that. Okay, so let's kind of look at some of these bumblebee issues. So I like to use um, bumblebees as an example of insect specialization and adaptation to their habitat and like why there's so many threats that are impacting them and what we can do um, because they're, you know, so well known and, and they've got some really neat behavior. Okay, so basically I'm just going to kind of go through some of the, the experiences that a Queen bumblebee has to have and all of the issues that you might encounter. So um, kind of following the pictures from like top to bottom and left to right, the queens emerge in early spring. Um, they spent all winter hibernating. Um, a lot of them don't survive, only the fattest that, that eat a lot of food the year before. Um, they stock up on food, they hunker down. They also mate before they overwinter. So um, they emerge as the temperatures start to increase. And um, obviously they used up all their food reserves, so they are hungry. And then they also have shriveled ovaries. Um, and they have uh, sperm stored in those ovaries because they mated the, the summer before. Okay. So they wake up and what do they need? They need food, they need food bad. They need to like start laying eggs. And so um, even when it's snowy or really cold, depending on where you live or where you are, they're still gonna come out and try to find flowers as much as they can. But they also will start to build their nests. Um, they make it of wax and pollen, things that they start collecting. They build their nest um, and by searching around the landscape for a burrow. Some of you may be have lucky enough to see this when queen bumblebees are kind of hovering around looking for a place to make a nest. I really like to watch them do that. Um, they'll use, you know, old flower pots, abandoned mouse holes, 
Sometimes they'll nest in your deck or your roof, um, abandoned birdhouse. They just really need to keep it warm. And so they try to bring us some insulation. Um, and the, clean, the queens will work alone for a few weeks. So they are responsible solely for going to get the food. And they do this and they have to actually keep their eggs warm. So I kind of put like a little bubble here <laughs> that says, you know, I shiver to keep my eggs warm about 85 degrees, even though I made a honey pot, it won't last long. I'll need about 6,000 flowers to keep up my energy level and my eggs alive. So I like to put that because I think people don't realize like just how many flowers these bumblebees need. And this is just one insect, right? They need so many flowers to maintain their energy level, to feed their offspring, to make the next generation of workers that then go out and do all the work for them so they can stay back and just lay eggs the rest of the season. Um, but they need a lot of flowers. So that in, in lies the biggest problem for bumblebees. Um, they really need so many flowers and the habitat loss really has dec decreased that. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, what do normal people do with kind of those early spring flowers? They come out, they want to keep their lawn nice, they mow it, right? Um, and so we'll talk about kind of what you can do, but basically what the bumblebee is experiencing is if it doesn't get enough nutrition, and then it has those other threats that are in the, in the environment right now. So pesticides, pathogens, diseases from honeybees, diseases from maybe commercial bumblebees, you know, if they don't have enough nutrition, they can't fight off those, those other threats, those pesticides and the pathogens. They can't process the pesticide through their immune system or they can't fight off the pathogen. Um, and so they really need not only a lot of flowers, but also diverse nutrition. You know, they're kind of like us, like we can't just survive on one type of food. We need lots of different types of food. So if you are interested in increasing habitat for bumblebees, you know, Think about flowers, you know, obviously there's a lot of talk about natives versus non-natives, but if we're just thinking about insects and bumblebees, you know, non-natives are not the best, but if they are flowers, it's much better than just grass, a mown, mowed grass. <laughs> so if you are going to remove your non-native flowers or something you might consider weeds, just make sure that you replace them and as immediately as you can with the native plants, with that flower, because you're basically taking away um, a, a floral resource for, for insects. So that's something that's um, really important to think of, to kind of avoid this trifecta of threats the bumblebee experiences. Okay, so um, just to kind of reiterate this, um, you know, what can you do for the bumblebees? It's just like, think like a bumblebee. <laughs> so if you think like a bumblebee, and um, you think like you're looking for provisions, food, different types of flowers, places to lay your eggs, um, nests, you know, you might start realizing how you can increase uh, habitat for them. And this will also bring other types of insects. It'll also bring birds. Um, year round flowers are really important, you know, depending on where you live, whatever season you can keep them. Um, the, that collection of papers that I mentioned earlier that came out, um, one of the quotes from one of the scientists for that was that if every home, school, and local park in the United States converted 10% of their lawn into natural habitat, this would get insects an extra 4 million acres of habitat. That's pretty extreme. So I thought that was a great calculation and something that really puts home like how much habitat we can provide in our small spaces. Um, if you don't have a lawn, if you don't have a green space, you know, potted plants and balconies, you know, some anything works really. Uh, the Xerces Society, I put the link down there. They have a really great resource where you can go and look at your pollinator friendly plants, depending on where you live. They have a Northwest one, a Pacific Northwest one as well. And then of course, another thing you can do to, to help um, bumblebees is to support the Endangered Species Act. And I'll get to that very soon. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to mention it here. Um, a couple more things on bees. Uh, the same efforts that you help to protect bumblebees will help protect other native, sol mostly solitary bees, such as things like sweat bees or leafcutter bees. Um, so they also need flowers plus nests. 
So if you're interested in providing some cavity nests, you know, you could just put some logs, with some holes in it, or buy one of these really fancy things <laughs> that um, I never do, but they're really pretty. Um, and you can kind of create nest boxes for them as well. Um, another thing that I just like to really remind people is that I think in the bee world is overlooked is that a lot of bees are ground nesting you know, like 70% of something like that of bees are ground nesting. Um, and I talked about how bare ground is really important for uh, tiger beetles, but it's really important for ground nesting bees and other ground nesting insects as well. So I like to say like emb embrace bare ground. A lot of people look at their garden, they're like, oh my gosh, I need to fill that bare spot, spot, you know, but don't do that, you know, keep some of that open. Um, don't put mulch over it, you know, keep the ground open. Um, some bees can kind of get between mulch, but it, it makes it a lot harder for them and they might be less likely to use that area. Um, so it's another reason to have, you know, flowers or forbs in your in your yard as opposed to just like monoculture grass because that tends to have natural patches of bare ground. Okay. Another way that you can help insects in general is to catalog what you see. Um, so in Oregon, there are some specific bee programs. So to back to bees, you may have heard of the Oregon Bee Atlas um, based out of Oregon State University. Um, there's a Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas that Xerxes runs. Um, but also, you know, if you, if you don't have the time or energy to do that, just like download iNaturalists and take a photo, the best photo you possibly can, because the clearer it is, the better it is to identify. identify. Um, and uh, download it to iNaturalists. Like that information is so useful to us scientists when we try to figure out what the range is of species and where species have been seen recently. Um, so I recommend you do that too, just to help out. It also helps for Endangered Species Act listings. Um, all right, so speaking of the Endangered Species Act, um, so our approach um, at the Center to Insect Conservation uses um, the Endangered Species Act, which you know has been argued, and I, I think it's pretty true that it is the greatest uh, conservation law that we have in this country, and, and probably pretty good in the world. Um, it, protect, it protects right now over 60 insects. Um, I, I got to update that number. It's probably a bit more. Uh, but listing insects is hard. It's very difficult. Uh, you know, data is sparse. <laughs> um, and so one thing you need to have when you list an insect under the Endangered Species Act is really solid, good information. You need to know where they were in the past and where they are now. You need to kind of show that that has declined, obviously, because you're concerned from a conservation perspective. And you need to know the threats of those species as well. So you need to have a lot of information. And for insects, it can be very difficult to gather that information. Um, so things like iNaturalists are really useful to try to figure that out. Um, another thing too is that a lot of people think uh, is that once insects are listed under the Endangered Species Act, like the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, that's the picture there in the middle, um, that they are, they're good, right? They're covered, um, <laughs> they're, they're protected for life. Um, but in fact, actually that's kind of when the work begins um, because basically they're already, on the, they're already threatened with extinction, right? So we need to help them. And Fish and Wildlife Service uh, are supposed to kind of write recovery plans, create guidance documents, as well as protect them from any harm. And so at the center, we really try to interact with the service at that level as well to try to figure out, okay, what projects are impacting uh, species that are listed as threatened or endangered? And what, uh, well, how are they impacting them? And what are they doing to prevent that impact as well as to mitigate it? So under the Endangered Species Act, um, you know, if they are gonna impact the species or its habitat, they need to then uh, do something about that. They need to mitigate for it. Um, and so we try to intersect there as well to come up with um, the best kind of mitigation to make sure it's the most precautionary way that will protect the insect or the species, whatever one is listed. Um, so let's look at some examples of endangered uh, species that are in the uh, in, in Oregon. Um, back to bumblebees, um, <laughs> uh, not unfortunately, but it's just, you know, we know a lot of more about them than other insects and they tend to be the ones that we've really got good documentation of their decline. So one that you may have heard, it's kind of famous in Southern Oregon is the Franklin's bumblebee. 
Um, so the Fran Franklin's bumblebee, unfortunately, is feared extinct. Um, we're hoping that it's not, that it's still somewhere in those mountains um, near you guys right now. Uh, but until about the late 90s, it was actually fairly prevalent, or so I'm told, um, in, you know, kind of South Central Oregon and Northern California. Uh, it, just, it drastically declined, and then the last one was seen in 2006. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service and a bunch of other people, um, myself included, one year got to go out, look, I got to go out and, and help them look for it. So we still kind of do search parties for the bee. And unfortunately, it still hasn't been found. Um, the Xerces Society uh, list, uh, petitioned to list it in 2010. Um, in 2019, so just a couple years ago, the Fish and Wildlife Service said that they were going to list it. Uh, they proposed to list it basically because it, it, it is endangered. Um, however, they haven't uh, finalized that yet. So it still is not quite protected, unfortunately, um, under the Endangered Species Act, but hopefully that will, will change soon. Okay. Um, oh, and it is threatened by um, pathogens. A lot of um, scientists think that it probably tanked because commercial bumblebees might have um, transferred some new diseases to it, um, but also pesticides. And because it was such a small population, it kind of just um, vortex down to, to nothing, unfortunately. Okay. A couple other bumblebees. Well, the Western bumblebee it's another species that was petitioned for in 2015. It's still being reviewed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. It was once the most common, at least until the bumblebee in the Western US and Canada. Um, however, only 13 individuals were collected um, between around 2000 and 2008 in Oregon and Northern California. Um, major threats again are diseases, pesticides and loss of habitat, those usual suspects. Um, Another species that I want to talk a little bit more about just because it's got really cool behavior and it's actually one that um, I petitioned to try to get listed on the Endangered Species Act uh, is the Suckley's Cuckoo Bumblebee. So an unfortunate result of the Western bumblebee declining is that um, there's been an even greater decline of its cuckoo bumblebee, Suckley's Cuckoo Bumblebee. So that's pictured there. The Suckley's Cuckoo has declined by more than 90%. And you can see here is a map we created where in yellow was where it used to be found before 2002. And then now currently there's only been those like few spots where it's been seen um, in early 2000s in the red. So this, why is it called a cuckoo bumblebee? Some of you who are interested in birds might have heard of cuckoo birds where they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and then their baby kind of kicks out the egg eggs of the other and then the host bird will actually rear it. Well, it's very similar. So basically what happens is the cuckoo bumblebee will enter um, Western bumblebee or, or some other host potentially uh, nests and subdue the queen and lay their own eggs and somehow convince probably chemical cue based the workers of the Western bumblebee to rear its own babies. Um, and, you know, some people are like, well, that doesn't sound very good if these bumblebees are already rare. But in fact, you know, in a, in a healthy population of bumblebees, it's really important to have these cuckoos um, because they really do help regulate uh, the bumblebee community. They help keep disease prevalence low. They help kind of keep the populations um, at levels that, that are sustainable. Um, unfortunately, they're both very rare now, um, and so we're kind of losing out on that interaction. All right, so away from bumblebees, back to tiger beetles. Um, another endangered species in Oregon is the uh, Sayusla hairy neck tiger beetle. Um, and this tiger beetle is a dune tiger beetle. So it's found, it used to be found kind of from sort of Washington all the way down to Northern California. Uh, where fresh water meets the ocean. And right now it's only found at about 17 sites, most of them in sort of central Oregon area. And nearly all of those sites have very few individuals. We're talking, you know, less than 50 at the most, which, you know, for an insect is very low. Um, again, these are fierce predators. Remember, they kind of need open areas. The dune beetles um, need open sand, which is the natural state of the sand dunes. 
Um, and seven of the uh, 17 remaining sites uh, in Oregon are concentrated along the New River area um, of critical environmental concern, so the ACEC, the New River ACEC. About uh, 10 to 11 miles uh, is where you can find most of them. Some of the other ones are found in the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area and the Sayasla National Forest. Uh, some of these areas have plans for restoration, which is great because one of the main threats like the tiger beetle in Santa Cruz is uh, invasive European grasses, the European dune grass, which some of you I'm sure are very familiar with, taking over the dunes um, in the sandy areas. And so removal of that is extremely important for a lot of species, including the tiger beetle. However, it could, because it does burrow in the ground, um, it can really be impacted by some mechanical removal. So like bulldozing and that kind of thing. If it's not done, you know, in a way that will mitigate threats to the beetle. So if you're interested in helping out with this species, it's you know, closer to um, you know, the Deschutes area at least, um, you can volunteer to remove uh, invasive grasses uh, by hand or by sort of more hand methods. Uh, and I think if you go kind of like saveoregondunes.org has some information, um, visit the Oregon Coast com has information, the Sayasla National Forest has information. So you can definitely find info on how to volunteer. Um, Deschutes Land Trust might even have some, I'm not sure, but okay, great. Where are we at? All right, we're still pretty good. Um, just one thing I also wanted to mention about the Endangered Species Act. I know the monarchs are often in the press and a lot of people talk about them and ask about them. And just because the center where I work uh, was involved directly with the uh, petition. My colleague actually wrote the petition um, to list the monarch as endangered and we've sort of been involved directly. I wanted to just kind of give a little update on where that is. So here's a graph of the Eastern monarch overwintering populations. And that's kind of how we've been counting them over the years. And you know, you can see there's a clear decline here of the um, area occupied by the monarchs in Mexico. And at this point, we're at an 85% decline over 25 years. Um, the monarchs have gone from like about a billion monarchs uh, to about a hundred million. So that's quite a big difference. <laughs> Um, there's lots of reasons for that, you know, loss of milkweed, uh, urban sprawl, obviously insecticides in agriculture, loss of some of their overwintering habitat in Mexico for the eastern monarch, climate change and severe weather like storms, such as the one that Texas is having currently. Um, more relevant to us uh, here on the west coast is the western monarch. Unfortunately, the story for that one is, is worse. Uh, the Xerces Society has been leading counts for, um, you know, quite some time now, 30 years or more. And basically they found that the monarch, Western monarch has been in severe decline and this past year was actually the most heartbreaking. Less than 2,000 individuals were actually counted this year on the West Coast in the overwintering habitats, which tend to be along the sort of um, coastal areas in California. So these are the same monarchs that you'll see up in Oregon. They're supposed to kind of come down in California and, and then overwinter on the coast. What's happening with them, you know, same story as the Eastern. However, the other issue with them is that they, they don't seem to be um, overwintering as much as they used to. They kind of have been sort of sticking around and, and um, not, not overwintering and breeding on, on things like tropical milkweed, which is a non-native milkweed. So we're still trying to figure out what's going on, but um, basically it's, it's a sad story. So what's going on with the listing? Well, there's lots of ways you can help. Um, right now, because of the new administration, Congress, luckily, had, and, and with our help and some other organizations, has really been pushing the Biden administration to immediately list even though, so what happened was, is that the um, Fish and Wildlife Service um, during the past administration said that the listing of the monarch was warranted, but it was precluded. So what that means is like, yes, the monarch really could use the help of the Endangered Species Act, but we're not gonna list it right now because we've got other priorities. Um, so unfortunately that was a little disappointing. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't the end of the road, however, it wasn't a clear no. And so now we are really pushing the new administration to list it immediately. Um, 
and also pass uh, the Monarch Act of 2021, which will provide 125 million in emergency funds over five years for the Western Monarch. So things like, um, you know, rest, restore their overwintering habitat, um, increase native milkweeds and decrease pesticide use. So some really good things, hopefully in the future for these, these populations. So you can really help um, us with this by pushing your members of Congress to, to uh, also encourage um, the administration of the Fish and Wildlife Service to protect the monarch as well as to pass the Monarch Act of 2021. Okay, so what about some other insects? You know, there's so many, <laughs> we've just talked about a few. It's a very hard to, we're already almost at an hour here, and it's very hard to talk about other, other ones um, with, with such limited time. <laughs> um, but basically some other things you can do, especially nocturnal insects, um, you can turn off lights. Uh, nighttime pollution has spiked and, and almost doubled in some places since the 1990s. Artificial lights can really cause insects to, to get tired and um, become prey really easily from things that are hunting them at lights. Um, you can also, uh, something really important is to just like leave your leaves, make, keep your yard messy, you know, leave like leaf litter down because so many things will overwinter in it. You know, here's a cool picture um, on the underside of a leaf of a moth um, cocoon. You know, so many insects will use leaves as insulation for the winter. Um, anything you can do to make your, your yard or your habitat heterogeneous, leave dead wood, leave snags for things that overwinter under bark. Um, you can try to organize to make your neighborhood or your city or your state more insect friendly. I know a lot of people are worried like, well, if I leave my yard a mess, my neighbors are going to be really upset with me. Uh, but one of the things you can do is try to get them to join you, you know, make, make a little coalition of, of insect habitat. Um, all right. So um, just if you are interested in trying to, to help more uh, to push some of the policy side of things, we have action alerts. There's the, the website up there. You can just Google Center for Biological Diversity Action Alerts. You can sign up to get them in your inbox and you can um, basically you know, sign petitions or get information how to contact your Congress members about uh, any legislation that's happening. Um, just to give you an example, of some of the policy that we are, we're trying to, to work on and to push, um, one of the groups of pesticides you may have heard about if you follow along this stuff are neonicotinoids, which are pesticides that are really um, harmful to insects, uh, not just bees, which most of the research talks about, but all insects, um, and also other, other animals, including vertebrates. And so we're trying to, to um, really push this Saving America's Pollinators Act. It's something that we've been working on. It's been introduced for several years. This one was in 2019 um, by Representative Blumenauer of Oregon. Um, he introduced it and um, unfortunately it died in committee in 2019. Um, it wasn't introduced in 2020. Obviously that year had a lot going on, <laughs> so it was overlooked, but I'm happy to say it's coming back soon. Um, and so we will be again kind of pushing that. So basically what it will do is it will uh, ban neonicotinoids as well as create a body uh, to review pesticides um, for their toxicity levels to insects and other pollinators, as well as to monitor native bees, which is something we really need. Okay, so just to kind of give you a recap, if you are um, interested in looking at, again, some academic literature, um, I was uh, privileged to be a co-author on this paper called International Scientists Formulate a Roadmap for Insect Conservation and Recovery. We got some cool figures in there, and this is one of them. It's kind of like the first step of solutions here. Uh, this is a lot of the stuff that I talked about, you know, education, restoration, conservation of threatened species, um, you know, phasing out pesticides, reducing light pollution and other types of pollution, increasing habitat heterogeneity. So lots of things, you know, that can be done right now that are really going to work. You know, it's, it's obviously a dire situation for a lot of insects, but, you know, we know what can help and we need your help, basically. So to some sort of we need actions on a large scale, international, national, public, private policy, and on a small scale, you know, replacing your lawns with insect-friendly habitat um, to reverse the decline. 
All right. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you to um, Jana as well as everyone at the Disuse Land Trust, to Hannah for interpreting. Um, and there's my Twitter handle there. And I, I put up a picture here of, of um, a firefly that's found in, um, in Oregon, the Douglas fir glowworm. Um, you know, just because I, I mentioned earlier that we didn't have the blinking fireflies, but we do still have cool looking fireflies. And the females of this species actually are, um, they look like larvae, so they're kind of like grub looking, but they actually do glow at night from the forest floor. All right. I can take some questions now. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, sorry, just getting myself no problem. set. All right, so I will let the questions start coming in. Thank you so much. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm so excited about insects right now. Um, <laughs> as some of the questions are coming in, um, I'm going to start off with a question I have, um, which is, I love honey so much. Um, am I ruining native bee populations? <laughs> such a good question and it's very hard and no you not, are not yourself ruining them um unfortunately you know it's not in, in many of these instances you know it's not like the consumer's fault or the person's fault right it's just we need better policy you know um right now i'm working on uh with with other partners trying to uh, basically protect public lands from honeybees because right now there's a lot of public lands that are being used to house honeybees when they're not on agriculture land. Um, that's really unfortunate because uh, public lands are kind of our last, you know, habitats for a lot of native bees, you know, especially in the Southwest. Um, and so we're trying to, to make it so um, apiaries, big, big kind of operations we're talking, you know, not like sort of small mom and pop backyard operations where like big honey producers, um, you know, aren't able to put tons of honeybees on these, these last great habitats. Um, instead, we're hoping, you know, that there can be other agricultural land, fallow land, you know, kind of what, how it used to be, um, you know, in a lot of the honey producers have said sort of it's like you know they're just getting pushed out by the pesticides it's like they have to leave the midwest because or the agriculture land because their honeybees are getting poisoned um and therein lies the common enemy right <laughs> and so what we need to do is focus more on on getting rid of those honeybee killing pesticides and cleaning up the habitat making it flower rich so they can have a place to put their honeybees um, and all, if all else fails, you know, you can always get honey too from like France and Germany where they're native. Nice. Um, so Lisa asks, um, can you comment on the effects, if any, of the extreme wildfires we have had over the last couple of years on insect populations in the West and have biologists seen any trickle down effects on their predators? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, some light fire or like, you know, sort of naturally fire is good, you know, in some cases, especially kind of in, in Oregon, um, where some of the brush can get, get burned and the habitat can open up and become meadows, which is really great for bees, you know, and there's some great researchers at the Oregon universities that have looked into this. Um, however, when we've got these like extreme fires, you know, these like hot burning extreme ones, you know, they can be really detrimental and, and kill off a lot of the habitat. Um, I, I recently saw a paper about um, smoke being really detrimental to, to butterflies, moths, so kind of the larger winged um, insects there. Uh, and so that's decreasing their populations. Um, so yeah, so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, I think, in some ways. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't really seen much information about the sort of trophic, kind of the, the predator component of it. Um, but that would be interesting for sure. Excellent. Um, 
let's see. Courtney asks, have we seen any new species of insects making Oregon home due to changing climate or loss of habitat in other areas that we haven't seen in our region before? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know any specific examples of this, but um, I have, you know, kind of noticed that the Western bumblebee, the one I mentioned before, and bumblebees are a really good kind of indicator too of climate change because they um, they like it cold. <laughs> they're fuzzy and they they get hot, um, and so they they tend to be in sort of northern climes. Um, and the Western bumblebee, you know, it's been declining a lot in California, and uh, it, it actually is up for listing in the state of California because it's, it's very rare here. Um, and, and obviously it's up for federal listing as well, but um, it has in the recent year, in recent um, surveys in the last couple of years actually been found more um, in the higher level. Attitudes, and I know that last year one of my colleagues, when looking for Franklins, found Western bumblebees. So um, that could be one, um, definitely. Excellent. Um, Veronica has a question that I can also contribute to. Actually, I think <laughs> um, she asks, "How can one get a supply of, say, milkweed to be able to start an eco-friendly area?" Do you use seed, seedlings, or which plant stage? Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was mm -hmm. just going to say um, the Deschutes Land Trust actually uh, offers free milkweed seeds that are native to Central Oregon, uh, mm -hmm. showy milkweed. So um, when we send the list of resources in the email, we will go ahead and include that link um, to be able to get your milkweed seeds mailed to you. Um, I don't know, Tara, if you have any other places that you know about or ways to um, go about it? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's great. I'm really happy to hear that you guys do that. Um, I would just say where when you do source it, um, you, know, you find native milkweed just to make sure that it's not treated uh, with any kind of pesticide. Sometimes sort of the big box nurseries like Home Depot and Lowe's, you know, they're trying to do better, but sometimes they can uh, label things as pollinator friendly. And unfortunately that doesn't necessarily mean it's not treated with pesticides. So if you can try to trace that back or use local nurseries or just use land trust <laughs> instead to get your milkweed, that would be better. Um, or just, you can ask them too and, and try to, you know, get them thinking about it and to change behavior. Definitely. All right, Derek has a long question. Okay. <laughs> While all species have intrinsic as well as ecological value and are, worth and are worth trying to save, do you think we as humans are at a point where we need to triage species and concentrate on those that are the most savable and have the highest ecological value? Oh, you know, this is a question that like, you know, it's debated about in the conservation literature a lot and it has been for like, I don't know, since I started my undergraduate career. So it's a good question and it's like a hard one to answer and so many different thoughts. And, and you know, I guess um, my sort of vision is, is like, you know, as much as I obviously work with the Endangered Species Act and hold it up and I do think it is, it's a great law. Um, I think if we kind of started from scratch, it would be better to have a more holistic um, conservation view and conservation laws and conservation mandates, I guess, if you will, from more of like an ecosystem perspective and kind of maintaining connections, maintaining interactions, maintaining, you know, different types of habitats, um, communities, ecosystem functions, that kind of thing. So thinking about it more from that perspective, as opposed from like, do we save this species or that species, you know? Um, and obviously with climate change, we need to think about like how we can make those uh, really resilient and resistant ecosystems as well. And so just try to basically do the best we can to try to conserve as much as we can and just like hope that, you know, it, it works out the best. But it's a hard question. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. All right, last question of the evening. Um, Diego asks, in the big scale agriculture context, how do you avoid the use of pesticides? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know, 
the, I don't have, you know, an answer to it. I think a lot of people would say, um, you know, that we need to kind of like I was just talking about, we kind of need to rethink like our, our growing methods. And, um, you know, a lot of other, you know, econ economists and other type of agro scientists have really looked into this to see if we can actually feed people, <laughs> you know, with smaller farms and sort of more eco design farms. And a lot of times the answer is yes, and we just need to be smarter about it. And then of course, you know, eat lower on the food chain. So we don't need like commodity crops to then go feed cattle, you know, to then go feed, you know, um, which go into just more meat eating, you know, which is not to say like, you know, to wipe that off. It's just to change the way that we, we, um, we eat basically just have less of it and kind of eat lower in the food chain, like I said. So if we do that, I think some of the studies have shown, you know, incorporating that we can also feed people using more ecologically based farming practices, which includes including um, hedgerows or habitat within um, crops that will increase um, natural enemies as they're called, as a conduct of biological control. Um, they need places to live and overwinter um, and that kind of things, as well as just doing like integrated pest management. You know, we can really reduce pesticides that way. Look and see if there's a problem first before you actually apply pesticides, you know, have a threshold of a pest before you apply them. The problem with neonicotinoids is that um, the vast, vast majority of them are systemic, which means that they're actually already in the seed of the plant before they're even planted. And so they're already incorporated into that plant. And then as the plant grows, it goes throughout all of this, the plant. Um, but that's already assuming a pest problem. And a lot of other studies, again, looking at the economics and yield have showed that like, you know, a lot of times it's not necessary to do that. Um, unfortunately, we're getting these like millions of pounds of them in the environment without any problem to begin with. So just kind of rethinking, I think that will really decrease the amount of pesticides we get out in the environment. Great. Well, I think we are done with questions, even though I know there are a lot coming in. Um, so thank you again, Tara, so much for your fascinating presentation. Lots of food for thought and ways that we can get involved. Um, and thank you to everyone uh, attending for joining us this evening. After the event ends, a survey about tonight's program will appear and we'd appreciate it if you could fill it out. It will only take you a couple of minutes, I promise. Um, and if you'd like to support the work of Deschutes Land Trust, please make a gift at deschuteslandtrust.org backslash support. Thank you everybody and good night. Thank you. Thanks.